Record on this computer. We are now recording live on air with live wires. <gasps> Ta -da. My goodness. Well, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK, guys, so last week uh, we sort of concluded a, a conversation talking about basic uh, universal basic incomes. And there was a guy called Dan Price who runs a company called Gravity Payments, and he decided to pay all of his staff, including himself, 70,000 US dollars. And it turns out it's actually worked out quite well. And he continues to do that uh, to this day. He's been doing it for about five years now. So I thought we could expand on that a little bit more. And David, I think you'd like to talk to us a little bit about centrally planned economies. Well, it's a big step from Dan Price to centrally planned economies, particularly in terms of the amount of dollars involved. But to put it succinctly, which is very difficult in my case, because I'm naturally garrulous, this worthy person uh, has decided that people should be paid irrespective of their output. Now, that's a very interesting concept, because it is the concept upon which the Soviet Union was based, which was that we would pretend to work and the state would pretend to pay. And this worked, um, you know, I mean, it produced a few dissidents and novelists like Solyensinin. But in the main, things were pretty mediocre but predictable. Uh, medical care was good. The uh, education system was fine and so on and so forth. But it collapsed in a heap. We all know that. Now, the arguments were given for collapsing in a heap is because of the intellectual prowess and enormous power of certain capitalists, including Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and of course, um, uh, the, uh, the US. But in reality, it collapsed in a heap because of technology. Now, that's most uh, unaccepted. But the reality is that you could not run an economy where demand had switched from the electrification of the human of the Soviet Union, which required rather a lot of steel and rather a lot of central planning, as electrif electrification of any country would. Demand has switched to people wanting many bras. Uh, I'm talking about braziers, those things, uh, which, which uh, at least one. Of I, I'm of aware us, of those things. One of the, the well, at least, at least one of the three of us wears yeah. them, though you never know these days. It may be more. Um, I, that, it could be all three of us. Who knows? Uh, exactly. <laughs> hence, the, hence the headshots. But in, in any case, in the days of old, when I was a good Marxist and working in Gosplan in Moscow, which I did as a student for a time, there was only one bra in the Soviet Union, and it was called the babushka bra. And the reason we called the babushka bra because it was only one size and one bra, and it was extremely big, and it was destined for what was at the time uh, the image of Soviet womanhood, which was rather large and rather grandmotherly and so on. But of course, it wasn't true, as we found out once the wall came down, and rather a lot of rather other ones appeared. Now, uh, I, at the time I worked, the Soviet plan, the GOS plan, five-year plan, was running five years behind the year we were in. So in actual fact, it was really most remarkable and surreal because it was planning for the past, and it had to plan for introducing many more types of bra, principally three. And the reason why it had to produce three was because Mrs. Khrushchev could not find a bra to fit her. And she said, this is an absolute disgrace. Let us give people a choice. Now, I continue to think that that was actually the downfall of the Soviet Union, because once you gave people any wow. sort of liberty to choose, you no longer had a method in which the computers could control production and satisfy demand. Now, I would put it to you all. You might say the economy didn't have enough support. Yes, but technological support. It wasn't that the oil industry collapsed. Oh, I see, okay. It wasn't that they were forced to spend a lot of money on weapons, which they shouldn't have been doing because the Americans could afford it and they could not, which is all true. It collapsed because you could not plan. There were too many networks. There were too many things to be satisfied uh, in, a, in, in an economy which is coping with a diversified demand. So it collapsed because it didn't have the right sort the of computers. Now, the one thing I would add, and then I really will the planning require, is... is that we've solved those problems. We now have wonderful big data and um, quantum computers, highly intelligent people. You can go online and buy and produce and sell anything you want. If you had had all that sort of stuff when the Soviet Union was running, you would not have had a gap between demand and supply. And because you would not have had that, you would not have had dissatisfaction, which brought the whole system down, 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 end. But the problem isn't supply, 
because it's easy enough to sit in a room and play with your computers and say, yes, we can produce this and we have these targets and we're going to make these targets. It's demand. It's getting people to pay for them. And it may be that they don't want just three types of bras. Maybe they want yellow ones, pink ones, different colors. Um, OK, we're going into the land of fantasy now. But the, in the, the conundrum between it all is that the suppliers want to supply everything uh, in one color. And the consumers want to buy individual articles. And capitalism has been able, with its very fuzzy logic, to kind of bring those together. Because if it doesn't work, then nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to buy it. So nobody's actually going to pay your salary. I mean, going back to Dan, the thing about Dan paying very large salaries is that you can be pretty sure that if somebody isn't performing, he's going to get rid of them and bring somebody else in at $70,000 um, a year who, who can do it and who is worth it. So I think the, part of the problem with centrally planned economies is they end up being centrally planned, often by the same people. There's no creativity. Um, there's no new ideas. It just atrophies. And um, uh, that's the reason why the Soviet Union ended up in the state it was. It got stuck in the 50s. Let me, let, let, let me, let, let, me it work. let me totally contradict you because uh, let us look at a country not terribly far away, uh, but let us call it Laputa or Brobdick Nag, it doesn't really matter, from Dean Swift, hovering in the air, high up, casting a vast shadow, and you look there, we have facial recognition, we now have mood recognition or facial recognition, we have the best online shopping experience and the most productive in the world, so all you have to do is to take those three elements and put them in a centrally planned economy, and it's not centrally planned anymore, in the sense that you drive it from the front end of surveillance to the back end of production entirely through existing technology, which will also tell you, by the way, I now understand in the latest advancement, that when a camera looks at somebody, like at your happy face, Richard, it can say, that is a happy face. But if, for instance, Carolyn looks at a bra and says, it will record that and say, okay, and that is not a good bra. We are not going to produce that bra. Or it may simply say, Carolyn is a dissident. Let's get away with her. Let's do away with her because she's obviously- Or she's person. just stepped on a bee or something. Or something like that. Which had nothing to do with the product itself. Her boyfriend's <laughs> just dumped her. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fool. But so I actually think you can- I mean, these, we, these things are certainly coming. You, I, I think they're coming. But at and the I, end of the day, what we're talking, what we're talking about with the technology is that you still have to have somebody program it. It's still really a very, very fast version no, of what a Richard, decision a don't. human being would make. But Richard, you don't. It'll program itself. Just as, for example, if you take an online shopping experience, it programs itself from the front end to the back end of the whole supply chain. And you can do the same thing with central planning, except you don't plan anymore. You actually make it a fully integrated process which is driven by the front end. Now, I'm not saying that that makes you go back to a, a Soviet-style central plan system. What I am saying is that that is the controversial reason I would put forward why the central, why, um, central planning collapsed, why the Soviet Union collapsed, why North Korea is not making a terribly good job of it because they're not very good at actually that sort of computer experience or consumer experience. The reality is that if you had the technology you do today, in the Soviet Union of yesterday, you would never have had the mismatch between supply and demand, the dissatisfactions among ordinary people that that caused, and the whole thing might have reached middle class status, not boom, boom status like Shanghai, but middle class status, and people may have just bloody well put up with it, which, uh, okay, we can argue that another day, it might not have been a bad idea. Well, I don't know, if putting up with it, I mean, the fact that people put up with it was part of the problem. I mean, you, I mean, when you went behind the Berlin Wall, when it came down, you know, I, I did, we were around the same time. The fact that there was no light in people's eyes. I mean, people our age, not even our age, people Carolyn's age, which is very much younger than ours, there was oh, yeah. no light in their eyes because their whole world had passed them by. Um, if you were 40, if you were 20, then the world was full of opportunity. You didn't have any money anyway. So the fact that your savings had gone to nothing was was fine. But part of the problem is that um, if people aren't allowed to make their own decisions, if people aren't allowed to 
focus on what they want to do and have their own hopes and desires, uh, then you end up with essentially robots. And if that system fails for any reason, well, who's to blame? It's the guys at the top. Now, of course, they will do their best to make sure that it's not themselves to blame. But at the end of the day, there is still a human element at the top. Maybe machines are uh, organizing things below, uh, but the machines are still programmed as a human being would think, even if they're learning from themselves. Most of the AI is based off uh, training of the machines, which is based, of course, on human experience. Um, so I think the human factor is still in there. And the fact that we have a very different environment today in terms of technology in centrally planned economies doesn't mean to say that a lot of the same mistakes won't be made. So are you saying that you think a centrally planned economy can never work or we're not in the right place I yet? think at the end of the day, you have to have that kind of freedom of choice that the market gives you at the bottom end to suck in products, to suck in demand, to suck in the sort of things that they want. You can't just supply them with one bra. But you see, Richard, what I have been saying is you don't have to. The, the Babushka bra was undoubtedly a monumental historical mistake, error. But you don't have to have that today. You can have, you can have a, no, today the same you can amount have, of bras as we have. In all different colors. No, yeah, absolutely. But you drive you, it. You, you can have the machine driving. printed. You're, um, you're, 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 you're such a reactionary. Uh, you are dri driving the system <laughs> from the wrong end. Because you are saying, okay, if you, as long as you're centrally planning, that's terribly bad and people won't have light in their eyes. Well, when I look around, all I can see is light in the eyes of Bezos and Musk. When I look around myself, in a, today, around um, wherever I am, let's say Laputa or Brobdingnag, I don't see light in people's eyes. I think they're snot gray as Dublin Bay, as jo or Joyce once described the place. Having said that, you can actually drive this economy as a centrally planned economy, from the consumer end to the back end by the automatic planning imposed by the technology of our day. Now, that's, I rest my case. But eventually the planning will be taken over by political issues, ah. by corruption, by vested interests. Uh, and then you end up with all the same issues that you have uh, in, in Russia and, and, and every and other planned where, economy. Now you get corruption and you, you get the, these things happening in Western economies as well, which is why we say that communism is the worst form of administration known to man uh, and, and uh, capitalism is the opposite. Sorry, I did that very badly, didn't I? Uh, communism uh, yeah. is the best version of man's inhumanity to man uh, and communism is the opposite. Do oh, right well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I feel this is going to stoke an argument. No, no, not an argument. <laughs> they, 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 all have, they all have issues. And I'm not going for the kind of Bezos thing where all the money is mine. And I'm not going for the one man, one vote thing where I'm the one man and I have the one vote. Somewhere in the middle is a balance because in everything there's a balance. In economics, there's a balance. In life, there's a balance. Uh, and what we need to do is to try a system that has that balance. It goes one way in one direction and comes back. It moves another way in another direction and comes back. You only have to look at US politics for that. Um, but the best form is a kind of a mixed economy where government is there, where it controls regulation, where it makes sure that uh, taxes are paid, where it, it doesn't print money to uh, support the economy. Um, uh, but by the same token, government isn't so strong that you end up in an environment of nepotism, corruption, and bad decision making. Which uh, so will it actually it, happen? Do you see it? No, of course not. With well, the pendulum will swing eternally, and um, you know when you talk about the focus of power, uh, corruption, nepotism. Well, I don't want to ask that question. I assume you're talking about Brobdingnag but not anywhere real that we would know. No. No. Although we, allowed, we, we are allowed we to talk about it in America. We could possibly ask you about somewhere real. These are all <laughs> hypothetical <laughs> questions. Oh, indeed. Oh, indeed. Let's move on to something else. Of course, what we should be doing is looking at uh, the how all this impacts the economy in, um, in the real world. Okay, yeah, and go in on In the then. US, Australia, Hong Kong, China, Okay, it, well, et cetera. Absolutely well, actually, fine. I think, how does it impact the economy in the real world? I think what it does is 
that it moves us back away from the glorification of uh, the free markets, the liberal markets of uh, the kind of Chicago school, uh, which was uh, Milton Friedman and all those people uh, who were terribly clever. Of which Hong Kong was the leading light. Exactly. I think we move away from that uh, and we move back towards something in the middle, which Richard has described as bliss. And I would say it's just another stage on the way to someplace else because we never get to this stage of bliss. But yeah, the it's biggest the zero thing, between minus one and plus one. Yeah, but from an investor point of view, and after all, we are um, talking to the, those happy, happy, happy investors with lights in their eyes out there. And um, from an investor point of view, what this says is if you're in the equity business, uh, uh, corporations are no longer just about making profits. They're about being just in terms of wages, being good citizens in terms of their products, and I can go on until you all go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> well, I, 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 no, well, what's been occurring to me recently is actually the Chinese system is here to stay. It's not going to be amended. If anything, it's going to be uh, advanced. It's going to be an alternative system. The central bank will look to stimulate the economy uh, and reduce liquidity at different times, but they'll do it in different ways to uh, the way it happens in the West. Uh, now, is there one system better than another? Probably not. The Chinese system is gonna have to work because that's how the Chinese Communist Party wanted to. Um, you're quite right, the free market system that we saw in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that's probably going to see the end of its days, maybe not quite the end of its days, but maybe it'll ease off a lot, because now we're seeing so much money created to provide so much welfare for ordinary people that um, we're going to see much more government, even in capitalist environments, because government's basically paying the bills. And this is where we come back to Dan again, paying his staff $70,000 a year uh, as a minimum wage, uh, because we're in an environment now where government is paying so much in terms of welfare that we're essentially getting a direct transfer from government to people like Dan, but not Dan, because he's paying his staff properly, because his staff who are working there can't afford uh, to have a normal life. And the biggest problem I think is that wages are just too low. I never thought I'd say that as a capitalist, but you know, we do need a minimum wage. We do need somebody like Dan to come in and provide enough income that people can go on holiday, can buy an extra mobile phone, can send their kids to school. A little bit of money so that even public schools are, 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 are better because perhaps their parents are able to contribute. Uh, but that's where we, uh, I, I, that's where capitalism needs to reform itself is we have to see ordinary people being paid a proper wage for the work that they do. Now that comes off two things. One of all, oh, uh, it, it comes off profits uh, for a start because it, uh, it has to be paid. Secondly, it comes out of central banks. So they go on being the front door and the back door of finance ministries who are making this sort of thing uh, happen. And of course the taxes, you really can't tax the same people you're giving money to. So who do you go after? And the answer is corporations. And that's a big thing for well, equity markets because equity markets, uh, by the way, I totally agree with you. You just said that the actual change in the systemic nature of our inverted commas free market capitalism is going to be much bigger than the economic changes in the economic system of China in the next decade. And I couldn't agree more unless there is some systemic shock to China, which brings down the whole thing uh, due to debt mountains or whatever. But the, uh, people have been predicting that since the cows came. Um, and that'll affect the whole world anyway. That'll but... affect the whole world anyway. But I totally agree with that. But the reality is bills do get paid and they get paid by central banks printing money, the rich getting taxed and therefore not putting money into the stock market, uh, particularly as governments are going to go after tax havens, many of which are in the current or past British empire uh, and are going to be kind of absolutely destroyed uh good thing too are there they're, they're, they're going to go they're, they're going to go after corporations there's no other way of doing it so you move back into a world and how do you actually get the corporations to earn the money to pay the taxes to pay the people to do nothing to sit in the car factories and get money from the government for not building cars they uh, how do you do that the answer is you go back to our youth. Now, our youth was full of many things, including big government and financing of those deficits by central banks. But there was one other thing. The Italians had to buy fiats. 
the British had to buy British mm. Leylands and the Australians had to buy Holdens. Now, all of these three brands of cars are almost forgotten to anybody who is not the age of pterodactyl like me. Uh, they're almost forgotten, but we've got to remember they were huge brands. And the only thing that was guaranteed about those motor cars, or if there's an American listening to this, autos, um, the only thing that was guaranteed about them is that one or four of the wheels would fall off within the first year. And that's where you go. <laughs> you build absolutely crappy products and sell them for an inflated price. And that's how you run such an economy. God bless us. All. Well, that's that, that that's what happens if you have a captive market today. Of course, that uh, a, a car, an auto, is built all over the world. You know, you'll have the wheels made somewhere else. You have something else made in Japan. You'll have parts of it in the U.S. Sometimes the factories, the assembly, will be in one location, and the headquarters may be in Japan. Now, where's the profit going? Uh, you know, where's the money going? Or is it better to have a factory in your area? that's employing a thousand people, um, uh, which is owned by a Japanese company, which is making no money whatsoever. Precisely. Except that, that Japanese company can close that factory down overnight if it so desires. Well, so yes, the world but, is a much more complicated place than, yes, than but, it actually but, but, was. But it became a complicated place because of globalization. Now globalization is complex and involves welcoming all the people who were previously in gulags into the free labor market. Bless them, they don't seem to be any happier than they were in the gulags because everything is so unequal and I can fully appreciate that. But the reality is globalization is over. It is over well, along with the liberal economics. It is going backwards at uh, you know the rate of a fast moving shunting engine in a marshalling yard. No doubt about well, it. Even, yeah. Even uh, today, I was reading a news story that was about the production of chips for cars. You know, you mentioned the auto industry and how the European Union are trying to double the production of chips there. And maybe that's because there's been a shortage and stuff like that. Or maybe it is, you know, going back from globalization and switching to well, more who, of a who, who would have thought a car had chips in it? In, uh, in, in, my in dad my is day, mortified by this concept. Uh, in, 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 in my day, I knew how to take apart a carburetor to clean it and put it back together exactly. again. But it's chip. What can you do with the chip? Um, but this is also an issue is that globalization, the benefits of globalization was just in time. Now we have situations where China is threatening Red Earth, where the Americans may be threatening Europe uh, of not providing um, the raw materials for the uh, COVID vaccines. Countries are now starting to say, well, hold on, we've got a little bit of a hold here. Let's grab onto it. But of course, what that does is it only makes the countries find more red earth elsewhere, uh, find ingredients or make their own ingredients elsewhere. Or as you say, Carolyn, make their chips um, in Europe, which can be used in European cars. So there is a pullback in globalization. But what I point out is that this is a pullback. Nobody is saying you cannot have these things. If you go back to China not that long ago, um, you know, the old joke was uh, everything made a noise on a Chinese car except for the horn. Uh, well, that's no longer the case. Chinese cars are a lot better. But people still wanted to buy a BMW. It may have been four or five times more expensive. It may have been very difficult to get one. People still wanted to buy a BMW. So as long as we don't have any complete restrictions, things are a bit more expensive. I think there's still a market. Well, yes, but I would say this, uh, Richard, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't pay uh, the massive. Why not? Because, because, because you're, I mean, you were obviously brought up in uh, luxury in the UK, as opposed to having a pig yeah, in the drawing room in Ireland. You can't have yeah. it both ways. Actually, I was barefoot got, in Africa. You've either got a pig in the drawing room or you have a drawing room, but you can't have both. Now, uh, to, to, to bring that back to your analogy, you have described a world in which people are getting paid by governments to give them a decent wage, give them this, give them that, and it's not matched, ma matched by productivity. Well, you can't have that and this idea that the world, in terms of the supply chain, should go around the Well, world. where does productivity come into it? When you have somebody like Jeff Bezos, who's worth uh, the richest man in the world, <laughs> and, and many billionaires in China elsewhere, you know, you can't say that his productivity is equivalent to the amount of money he's making. Can I well, ask an important a... question here? Uh, also, what happens when we're all replaced by robots? Oh, I think um, we go out and we, we, we imagine how to make robots be robots. Uh, I'll be sitting I, on the I, I'm not in the, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the brainy people will, will, will just move up the income scale and they will, uh, you know, live in a kind of 
a quantum world where you're actually uh, telling the robots or training the robots what to do, even as the robots get more and more sophisticated. But of course, then. But that's that's to, actually. Then we come back to the masses. What do they do? What do the masses do? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that that that's the whole point because we're already seeing robots take over factories. I mean, uh, many of the sheds now that are facilitation sheds cover huge acreages um, are all automatic. Um, we're seeing these relatively simple tasks being taken over. In finance, of course, we see now straight through processing destroyed a lot of million dollar jobs, but we're also coming through to uh, computers being used in the law um, to check precedents and things, uh, being used for uh, operations with surgeons. So looking in 10 or 15 years time, a lot of jobs which were very productive and worth a great deal of money will no longer be there. Okay, but then what happens is the computers are earning the money. Well, computers don't vote. Of course, if artificial intelligence does uh, achieve equivalence with human intelligence, then they probably will vote. and They'll vote us out of existence, which will solve the problem we're discussing because we'll be just done away with. If they're allowed to vote. If they're, <laughs> well, no, 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 they just empower themselves. But assuming that does not happen very quickly, then the consumers earn the money, governments take the money from the computers and give it to the burgers. I'll stop that. Right.